Welcome to the October 2nd, 2014 Murfreesboro City Council meeting. Uh, Rick Lalance, Councilman Rick Lalance, has our prayer and our pledge. Bow with me. Lord, thank you so much for the blessings, um, our families. Uh, thank you for the citizens. And Lord, just give us wisdom tonight and throughout the week as we try to do the best we can do uh, to lead our city. Um, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's good to see everyone here tonight. I have a couple of uh, recognitions. want to say thank you. You see several people with Leadership Rutherford who are here. Uh, Miss Nancy Phillips with our school board is is sitting over here, so we welcome you here. And then also uh, newly elected county commissioner Sean Kaplan, who uh, represents the north side of Murfreesboro, is also here. So, Sean, it's, it's good to have you here. I have a proclamation I'd like to read real quick. <clears throat> okay. Vice Mayor Young, if you'll take the chair. I have a proclamation we want to read tonight, um, and all of us have been touched by this in, in many different uh, ways, but looking up, we many of us are, are, uh, are dads and moms, and uh, so have gotten to know several people involved in, in uh, a worthwhile organization and wanted to read you um, a proclamation that we've prepared, and Lori, <laughs> Karen, and then Mark. Uh, glad to have you all here. Whereas every September we renew our commitment to curing childhood cancer and to offer our support to the brave young people and their families who are fighting this disease and in many cases lose the battle. Forty-six children in America are diagnosed with pediatric cancer every day, and each day seven more children die as a direct result of this disease. Childhood cancer remains the leading cause of death by disease for American children under the age of 15. For those children and their families in memory of every young person lost to cancer, we unite and stand behind improved treatment options, advance research, and encourage those in positions of trust to find the funding necessary to do a better job. In their honor and memory, we wear gold awareness ribbons. Whereas with great strides in the fight against pediatric cancer have been made, it simply has not been enough. The five-year survival rate for childhood cancer, such as leukemia, has increased almost 80%. In the same time period, only marginal improvement in the survival rate of solid mass childhood cancers has been experienced, and the budget for pediatric specific, specific cancers has decreased. To put it simply, we have much work to do. The treatments available for these once adult cancers are made for adults and not easily survivable by our greatest resource, our children. And we deserve better awareness for this epidemic as in that it would be a giant step in the right direction. And this is where we get into why we're here tonight. We are dedicated to carrying this progress forward. We stand in support of local nonprofit organizations such as Clinton's Club and the Live for Tay Foundation that provide both tangible and non-tangible support to local families faced with this disease. Clinton's Club operates in the memory of a seven-year-old, Clinton Milliken, and the Live for Tay organization operates in memory of Riverdale student Taylor Florimo. Both of these organizations remain committed to easing the financial burden of family support of a childhood cancer. All children deserve the chance to dream, discover, and simply to grow up realizing their full potential. In September, we extended our support to young people fighting cancer for that opportunity, and we recognize these organizations who commit themselves to advancing pediatric, a pediatric cancer-free world. We couldn't get the groups here for September, so even though it's early October, we wanted to make sure and uh, pro proclaim that now, therefore, I, Shane McFarland, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, do hereby proclaim September 2014 to recognize Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in Murfreesboro. And we have Lori uh, Hoy, who's here with Clinton's Club, and Karen, who is here with uh, Live for Tay Foundation. So we thank you all for coming and are glad to present you this proclamation. Thank you, Shane. Thank, thank you. you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you all for coming and thank you for all the work that you're doing, not only for the residents and, and children in Murfreesboro, but for the many people that you help in Rutherford County. And I think that all the council members can agree that we see how much work that our nonprofits do and the heavy lifting that we can't do and the things that you do in the community and and uh, heartfelt, we say thank you for what you do and how you, you try to make Murfreesboro and you do make Murfreesboro a better place for all of our residents to live. So thank you. And as Mayor Bragg would say, uh, you're welcome, you're free to stay, or you're free to leave. <laughs> so that's totally up to you guys. All right, we'll move into the consent agenda. You have several items on the consent agenda. Um, if you have any questions. Rick, did you want to <laughs> move for passage? Second. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. Mr. Lance, Ms. Gales Harris, Ms. Wright, you'll call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Lalance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Uh, we'll now move into approval of the minutes of the September 18th, 2014 meeting. How can you be first if we go alphabetically? Hearing no comments, I, I move that we approve the minutes as presented. Second. Mr. Smotherman, Mr. Lalance, Ms. Wright, call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Yes, Aye. Mr. Lalance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. <clears throat> Uh, first readings, consider the passage on first reading, Ordinance 14045, amending Chapter 2, Article 5, and Sections 2149, 21 and a half 15, regarding the Golf Commission and City Golf Courses. Mayor and members of the Council, this ordinance is, as I tried to explain the cover memo, updating uh, the sections of the City Code that deal with our golf courses and our Golf Course Commission. Uh, the language that's currently in the code was written when they were planning for should Murfreesboro have a uh, golf course. And, of course, we all know how successful that uh, group was in, in bringing multiple golf courses to us. Um, there were also some errors that had crept in over time. Uh, this is fairly straightforward. Uh, the purposes have, have been Ref, uh, modified to reflect what, what is now going on in the world of golf. Uh, the other sections uh, referencing trespassing and whatnot are simply been broadened to include uh, the uh, second course that the city owns and, and the VA course that it operates. The Golf Commission approved uh, the ordinance at their September 10th meeting and staff recommends it to you for adoption. <coughs> Motion there. Move for passage on first reading. Mr. Young, have a motion? Second. Mr. Lance, have a second. Any discussion? <coughs> Ms. Wright, we'll call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Lalance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Move into new business and consider for approval a renewal of a certificate of compliance for Barbara Hudson Fry and, Cur and Curtis Hudson at Bubba's Wine and Liquors, 2510 South Church Street. That's right. Mayor, every two years, retail liquor stores must have their certificate of compliance renewed, and uh, these two individuals have met our background requirements, and uh, we recommend approval for their renewal to go on to ABC for them to process. I'll move for passage. Second. Mr. Lance, Mr. Young. Ms. Wright, we'll call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Lalance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. And now we'll hear from the Water and Sewer Director with regards to executive summary on fiscal year 2013 and 14 and fiscal year 2014 and 2015. Mayor, while uh, Mr. Gore gets his PowerPoint uh, squared away, I just wanted to remind you of. of a little while ago, uh, the council had asked that each month we get a uh, different city department come and report on, uh, report to you on different programs and activities. Uh, thought maybe the meeting where we have the public comment might be a, a good uh, time to just plan for that. So uh, tonight is actually your first uh, presentation from one of our city departments about uh, what they've been working on and uh, where we may be going. Well, uh, Mayor, City Council, thank you for the opportunity tonight. I'd always enjoy talking about the successes of the water and sewer department so 
Uh, I would like to give thanks to all the, the folks I work with at the department. It really has been a pleasure these past <laughs> two years to work with such uh, wonder prof wonderful professionals. Uh, and I won't try to name them all because we've got 165 employees and they're all, they all take it to heart what they do. And on top of that, the fact that the council, the Water and Sewer Board, the city manager's office has been so supportive of everything we do. Um, it's just been a real pleasure to, uh, to build momentum and, again, to build the relationships that are needed to, to develop that trust. And I, I will say I'm, I'm a part of the uh, 2015 class of Leadership Rutherford, so if there's any heckling uh, in the background, uh, you all can uh, abscond. Fuss at them. Don't let them make. Don't your, let them make fun of me. Are you getting your credit tonight? I'm get, I don't know. I guess I don't know if I get. I don't know if I get credit tonight since I have to be here or not. I'll email Stephanie. <laughs> okay, please do that. <laughs> tell, tell I need her not I'm, to give you credit. Tonight. I need. I, I need there. a few extra gold stars with Stephanie. Honestly. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and start the uh, the uh, the update, and the first thing I want to go through is really kind of not, not necessarily core values, but some of the values we look at when we're doing projects. And that's the sustainability word. We really want our projects to be long-lasting and have a sustainable impact on the community. Compounded with that, I think a balance, to balance that, uh, we want it to be financially viable. Uh, I think there's a lot of sustainable solutions out there that are very, very expensive. Uh, so we want to make sure that the, fi the financial viability of our solution uh, meets the affordability indexes of our community. And then finally, we do want to be customer focused. I know that this is a very strong impetus by the council, city manager's office, and we take it very seriously at the water and sewer department. So what are the projects, these snapshots? We have some system. Uh, we've got collection system, distribution system, and of course our plants. Uh, the black is, I'm kind of looking at the black, the black text is maybe accomplishments from last year. The red text are things that are coming up. Um, information technology, we've had a lot of software uh, solutions. And I'm so, I've got hard copies of this. If, if, Melissa, if you wouldn't mind passing that, because I know it's kind of tough sometimes to see on the, on the TV screen. Thank you very much. We've got strategic planning. Uh, We've, we've undergone some very sophisticated permitting strategies with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. Those obviously need to dovetail with Murfreesboro 2035, which is a big kickoff that uh, the 20 year comprehensive plan that the city's undertaken. And we, there's a, there's, it's not necessarily a buzzword, but a lot of communities are looking at water resource integration planning. And we want to make sure that Murfreesboro 2035 is supported by. Uh, a plan to make sure that water, sewer, reuse, and stormwater services uh, complement that plan. And then performance-driven, I've gotten up here and, and gotten on my soapbox about effective utility management. Uh, those are some targeted uh, goals that we want to meet, 10 attributes. We've developed financial policies this past year, and uh, we're still working on I&I &I removal, but something we're, we're really focusing on in the next couple of years is recovering water. Okay, so some review of existing projects. You've seen this slide before. A lot of this, hopefully, is repeat. Uh, that you, uh, I think I'm up here enough uh, that some of these will ring a bell. We've got the Southwest Regional Pump Station, a force main, and that ultimately gets to the Headworks facility that's at the plant. <coughs> that's our main screening facility. Uh, this is a, a SRF project, all three of these projects. Uh, they're in or a magnitude of 28 to $29 million. Uh, as part of what we've done at the plant, we have had uh, a nitrogen removal strategy at the Sinking Creek Wastewater Plant. We have a fats, oils, and grease program. We have also demonstrated some infiltration inflow reduction from our sewer system. So I believe we're, we're on the leading edge of a lot of these uh, initiatives. And uh, as a sideline or as a, as a side benefit, we are actually through these process changes at the plant, we're saving almost $132,000 a year in power costs each year. So what does that allow us to do? Uh, through those innovative techniques, it's allowed us to get a plant expansion permit from the state of Tennessee. We are going to increase the capacity of our 
16 million gallon a day plant up to 24 MGD uh, without having to go do uh, some crazy things like run an effluent line to the Cumberland River. So we've uh, it's been a, a, a lot of folks at the wastewater treatment plant has it's been a really a, I hate to say grassroots but it's been an operator roots program. They have really done some innovative leading edge process changes out there that is getting some real recognition not only from the state but even uh, from our region about how they're operating the biological uh, reactor out at the uh, the carousel oxidation ditch out at the plant. So kudos to them. Uh, we've secured the state revolving uh, loans ranging from 1.1 to 1.3 interest over a 20-year fixed term. That gives us a max debt ceiling of 71.1 million. Uh, we're hoping uh, that, that we're going to be coming in more around the 58.3 million uh, target of expenses on these five projects. Looking at information technology, going back to our uh, customer information system, we uh, developed an information technology master plan. Uh, I'm going to throw a little red cloud up here. This is the corner of the plan that really deals more with engaging the customer and being proactive with the uh, <coughs> customer service. We did an entirely new customer information system. That went live June of this year. It took us 18 months to get that uh, live. We now have a mobile workforce management. We wirelessly send out service orders to men in the field so they do not have to come back into the office and pick it up on paper. Uh, we are about to go live with our intera interactive voice response system, which is a telephone system that allows people to query their account information, make payments over the phone. And this year, uh, advanced metering infrastructure, that's AMI, We've done a business case. We've solicited proposals, and those will be coming forward to you uh, in the future. As part, this is something online. This is Link. Uh, you can actually set up an account with the Murfreesboro Water and Sewer Department at this point. Look at your billing history, make payments online, and uh, and look at basically conduct water audits month by month to see if you're using uh, the same amount of water. We also, I put a number little six up here with the FIS, the financial information systems we're working right now with the finance and tax department in implementing a new uh, financial system that will bring the water and sewer department and the city tax department under one umbrella with, regard, with regards to a financial system. Going to the advanced metering infrastructure core benefits and goals, uh, basically this, the, the, the great customer service aspect of this project is we're going to be able to tell folks when they have a leak before they know it they have a leak. This is a situation where we'll be able to take hourly readings wirelessly uh, from uh, people's water meters and if we see usage through the night or if we see a usage that is abnormal above the average of that customer we'll be able to send them email and a notification that it appears that something's something's not right they need to check for leaks. Uh, also, it's going to reinstate uh, uh, rate payer equity in the fact that we're going to be putting in new meters. All the new meters are going to be accurate. So there's a lot of meters in our system right now that we believe are inaccurately measuring water. And so we're get, having to subsidize those inaccuracies through other rates, eight rate payers. We're going to take our manual, meeting, meter, manual meter reading business operations and we're going to eliminate that altogether. And we're going to elevate these and, and reassign this existing personnel to more uh, leak detection roles uh, and field service roles. And we're going to confront real water loss. We're going to look at uh, some industry metrics on co conservation. And we're going to get our unaccounted for water, which is in the 27, 28 percent range. And we need to get that down into the low teens. It has a strong financial return. Uh, we're looking at about an $8.5 million expenditure. It's got about a six and a quarter year payback period and an internal rate of return of 19%. It's, it's really just, uh, it's, a good, it's a good business plan. What we've looked at though, trying to be a little bit innovative, we've taken uh, some of that enhanced revenue that we expect through the accuracy that we expect to regain through the meters, looking at taking some of that not only to pay the project back, but to actually offset some rates, put that towards some operating expenses. That puts the payback out to closer to eight years. 
and the internal rate of return closer to 16 percent. But what that does is it our rate design that we're looking at over the next four years looks about 50, per, 50 cents per month per, per residential customer. And we're able to do that through the implementation of this advanced metering infrastructure. Looking at strategic planning, uh, permitting strategies moving forward. We know we're, not, we're growing. We're looking at a very aggressive growth over the next 20 years. The planning framework that we've utilized, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I really think it's important to understand. If you look at the far right-hand uh, right column, the annual budget, that's kind of where we've been year to year uh, grinding out a new budget annually and just living and looking uh, at a year to year forecast. We've kind of going into that uh, second column from the right, we've actually gotten, and it's Joe Kirchner and, and the Water and Sewer Board and the Council has allowed us to get into a, a stronger financial planning, looking at five-year uh, pro formas, cost of service studies, which has allowed us to look at that uh, rate design. This past year, 2013, we put in a, a strategic planning document. That's supported by our information technology master plan and our effective utility management strategy. And go, getting to the far left corner where we're at now, we're looking at Murfreesboro 2035 and the water resource integration plan. So we are going from a from a very narrow focus, looking just immediately ahead of ourselves, and we're trying to back up and get that 30,000-foot view and make sure that we're not only looking at those sustainable solutions but those affordable solutions. I've always said we want to be leading edge, but we don't want to be bleeding edge. So we want to drive that sustainability towards an affordable solution. So we're looking at flows at the West Fork. We're doing studies out there. We found two big springs on the West Fork. We're looking for more assimilative capacity in our existing stream. Will these underground springs that surface at the confluence of uh, overall creek, will that give us an, a, an opportunity to, to discharge more effluent into the West Fork? Uh, we have the Coleman Farm, a 400-acre farm on the north side of town. It's, got the, it's bounded by the East Fork Stones River. We're doing significant water uh, quality modeling studies on the East Fork right now to see if it is a candidate for receiving more effluent. I don't want to get into too much of a, so, of, a, of a rabbit trail here, but we're in a very unique situation is that we are generating so much water. You, know, you hear about the folks out west that don't have enough water supply to drink, and they're struggling to figure out how to supply drinking water. We are generating so much effluent, our receiving streams are very, very small. And so we're having our, our main challenge over the next 20 years is how do we dispose of an environmentally uh, a friendly or environmentally responsible manner the effluent that we generate. It's a very high quality effluent. We're using it on the golf course. We're using it on the gateway irrigation. Uh, it actually meets the 1972 drinking water standards. But for some reasons, uh, it's called anti-degradation criteria. The feds don't like us putting it back in the, in the rivers. We're working on that. Water resource integration plan, I won't go through this entirely, but we're trying to look for, uh, it's called the one water uh, leadership Summit, we're trying to find right water for the right use. Only treat the water to a level that you're going to be using it for. To take drinking water to irrigate your irrigate property is probably uh, taking water to too high of a purification standard for irrigation purposes, just to put it back on the ground. Uh, we also want flex introduce that flexibility in our regulatory community. How can we leverage the stormwater program, which is a non-point source uh, 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 NPDES program and how can we leverage that with our point source or our, or our treatment plant uh, regulatory framework. Bottom line, we want to integrate it with stormwater, repurified, drinking water, sanitary sewer. We need to get smarter about how we use water. This shows that. <clears throat> right water for the right use. Uh, you can take it to a secondary, tertiary, or an advanced treatment and what's happening is a lot of times you're advanced, you're treating it so much better than what you're actually the raw water that you're bringing in to treat for drinking water. Uh, what the industry is now doing is they're taking that advanced treated water, and this is where you get into that potable reuse idea. You're closing the loop. You're taking that advanced treatment and you're putting it, blending it back in with your uh, raw water and running it back through your drinking plant. It's happening in a lot of places, specifically uh, San Diego. Right now, their current sources of water, if you look at that little green wedge, 3% is uh, recycled water. Uh, they just happen to, to be looking at year 2035 as well, 
And by year 2035, they want 30 percent of their uh, drinking water supply to come from potable reefs, meaning they want to take it from the effluent of the, of the waste treatment plant, blend it indirectly or directly put it back into the drinking water system. That is happening across the nation, not just San Diego. It's all across Texas. It's all across Arizona. Uh, they, are, they are needing water. So performance driven, real quick, we want to get into the EUM results. Uh, we have defined current and target performance, blue being target, green being existing current. This is just, it's a spider graph, and we are trying to stretch ourselves to meet uh, what we want, our, our goals, our targets. We've got some work in some areas, customer service being one of them. We've set up uh, uh, financial dashboard or financial policies this past year. We've sec keep in a, a secured reserve, 19.6 million, which is 12 months of operating and maintenance. We've got committed 5.2 million. We have a 13 million that's unassigned, available for projects, so that won't affect ratepayers. Uh, and we have 2.6 million designated in the budget as going towards repair and replacement projects. So that's been assigned, uh, but not spent. We are working vigorously to, to regain capacity in the sanitary sewer system through reducing infiltration and inflow. And something that's coming up, uh, the picture to your left, we have a new bench test meter. That's where actually we are, <clears throat> when we have meters coming into our plant, before it goes into the ground, we are running it to ensure that it meets industry standards before and, and accuracies before we go put that in the ground. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we, are, we have just uh, you approved it tonight. We have a, uh, a contract for a, uh, you can see that van. It actually has a camera coming out of the sunroof, and it does some infrared thermal imaging, and it actually rides the streets and can identify leaks out in the road. You can see the the thermal image there on the bottom, that dark blue spot is a leak uh, that we're, uh, so we're doing a pilot program of $75,000. It's going to be about 50, mile, 50 miles of water line to see if we can, if this technology is going to help us find uh, leaks out in the roads. So that is my summary. Uh, and I know it's lengthy, but it, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Very good. Very good. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Gore? <clears throat> Mr. Gore, thank you for giving us an update. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move to item six. Consider for recommendations the Parks and Recreation Director with regards to bids for the sports com renovations. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, good evening. I have one item for your consideration, and that is the bid for the renovation of sports com. On August 24th, we did advertise uh, for the renovation. Um, we opened bids on September the 11th, and we had five bidders. Um, there was an extensive list that I put in your packet uh, from Mr. Uh, um, Lynch that outlines all the things that we're going to do uh, in the renovation of Sportscom, including a 3000 uh, square foot addition. One of the other things that I have put in here for your reference, and I thought I would reference this before going any further, is the uh, floor plan design. And just to uh, go over some of the things that we're going to do at Sportscom in the renovation. Uh, as we looked at the renovation, not only did we look at things that needed to be upgraded, like roof and um, HVAC systems. We also looked at the programming end of the um, Sportscom and we looked at what we needed to do in terms of, of fitting the program that we have today and looking at what we need to do to expand our program in the future. So we spent a lot of time, I guess most of the time that we spent trying to get our plans and specifications together was figuring out what in the heck we need to do for the future. Um, and one of the things that uh, we identified was we really need additional space. In the meeting rooms, which is shown on the right-hand side, uh, we've expanded classes into there. Of course, that is the place where we have early voting. And when we have early voting four times a year, we have to move those 
classes out into the gym. Uh, when we do that, generally we'll get uh, complaints from people because now they can't play basketball or people that are in the weight areas uh, can't hear because of the music. Um, so we started looking at what would be the best way of redistributing the activities and how could we maximize those spaces. So what we did is we went to the second floor and we created two exercise rooms there. That is currently where the fitness area is, where the weights are. Um, we um, have in the addition in the front that you can see on the right hand side uh, made that. That's a 3,000 square foot addition that's exactly the same size as the upstairs where we had our fitness area and created a new fitness area. We think this is a better fit. Um, most of the people that work out are there over an hour. There's no restrooms upstairs, so this puts them closer to the restrooms downstairs. It gives us a better opportunity to oversee that particular area uh, because you can see where we've moved the, uh, the reception area. Uh, we've added an elevator. You can see where we've taken what used to be the old fitness area and created some office areas, which we really needed. And then one of the other things that we do, we have a lot of calls for pool parties. We call them splash-tastic pool parties. And when they're having their presents, cake, ice cream, those kind of things, they always are in the meeting rooms. Well, if those meeting rooms are occupied either by early voting or other meetings, then that limits our ability. So what we've done is we've added that little party room. We think that will be used um, a lot uh, for that particular purpose, but we can also use it for other activities as well. And then as you come down, you can see the dressing rooms. Those will be redone. And one of the other requests that we've had uh, over the years is to add a family dressing area. People with disabilities that need assistance either by a family member or a caregiver or um, dads that are bringing their daughters or moms that are bringing their sons want a dressing room that they, they both can go into. So we're adding a family dressing room there. And then also uh, we're expanding our concessions area. Since uh, the advent of Burrow Beach, our expansion of our swimming pool to a water park, uh, we, uh, we generate over $100,000 in sales in concessions. And so this is going to give us the ability to open two windows. Most of the time, if you go out there during the busy times, the line will be backed up from the concession windows, gosh, probably 50, 75 feet. So we, we're looking at better customer service at that particular point. Going back to the bids, we did have five bids. Uh, Barron Construction out of Brentwood was the low bid with $2,487,000. Um, um, because of the way the building industry is today, and we were unsure really uh, where the bids would land, so what we did is we put in alternates, um, and we're recommending out of the six alternates, five of those, alternate number one is to sand and refinish the gym floor. Alternate number two is to resurface the track. Alternate number three would be to expand the concessions as I had spoke of. Alternate number four we uh, did not accept. That was a reclaim on the uh, water in the pool um, recirculation system. Uh, we looked at the cost of that, we looked at the cost recovery, and we looked at the length of life of the equipment, and we just didn't think that was a prudent investment. Uh, and then number five is replacing the air ducts in the indoor pool. And number six is a, a looped water line uh, that was requested uh, by, the, um, by the fire department. Um, because when SportsCom was first built, uh, it was connected to a smaller line uh, over near the uh, fire hall. And so to give it adequate fire protection, um, we're looking at adding an additional water line. This water line will 
we will connect that water line near to Jarnet, and it will come through the park. And if you remember the um, the master plan that we presented for McKnight Park, there was some additions and some improvements in the park, and this water line would serve both. So we're recommending that um, we put the water line in and that the water line come out of the uh, CIP money for McKnight Park because we know that uh, in the future we would have to put that water line in anyway. So uh, with that, um, yesterday uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission met. This was presented to the Parks and Recreation Commission. It was approved unanimously by them uh, and uh, the architect uh, engineer has uh, concurred. So we recommend the bid from Barron Construction in the amount of $2,771,122 for that to be approved and that for the council to authorize the mayor to execute the contracts contingent upon legal department's review and approval. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, one thing I may want to add before opening for questions, a timetable. Uh, if this is approved tonight, we plan to issue, once we get the contracts, notice to proceed, uh, performance, everything that uh, Ms. McGannon will require. Uh, we we uh, think we'll issue a notice to proceed uh, sometime near the end of this month. Um, this project uh, will... Uh, go through uh, April of 2015. Uh, we're looking at uh, closing that out May of 2015. And we're going to be working during that time except for March and April. March and April we'll need to close down Sportscom. There's just certain things that will need to be done. But we've worked out a system uh, so that we can minimize hopefully the impact to our customers and minimize the time, the time that we're closing sports time. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. I've got a question. Vice Mayor Young. Uh, Manny, when does the uh, Borough Beach open? Is it? It opens on Memorial Day. So that's the last of May. Last of May. We have activities uh, before that. You know, we do the Duck Derby, some other things. Um, and that's why we've set this date. Uh, we think we can be complete by if, then. If there's any delays in the in the construction process, will that delay? Will this will that have an effect on the opening of the of the outdoor pool? No, sir. Ah, there you go. No, sir. Um, that's one of the things we're going to talk to the contractor about. And if if we do the additions to the concession stand, we want him to try to get those first. Right. Good. Any more questions? Yeah. Councilman Washington. And I hate to ask you this, but I'm going to. Uh, I saw a lot of replacement light fixtures in this uh, document. What type are you using? Could I yield to Mr. I thought so. Lynch? <laughs> I don't know. Hello, I'm Lyle Lynch with Johnson & Bailey Architects, and we prepared the plans and specifications for the building. Uh, Mr. Washington, would you repeat the question? I couldn't hear you. What? what? Light fixtures. <laughs> light fixtures. Okay. We're not replacing all the light fixtures, but we're, we're replacing a big part of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the gymnasium specifically, we're going with the LED light fixtures. Some of the other places that they aren't on quite as much, we're not doing that because of the cost. Got you. Thank you. Mr. Hines, I have a quick question. This is probably be, I guess, for, for Mr. Goodwin and, and you. Are we, since this is such a large project with such a tight timeline, are we utilizing construction management in this, or, or are we handling this internally? No, we're handling it internally. Okay. Uh, I, I can't say we work with a, a lot of design professionals, and uh, Mr. Lynch is at the head of the class when it comes to uh, keeping uh, things on task and on schedule and holding the uh, contractor accountable. Okay. Any more questions? Mr. Smotherman. 
Lanny, I, I pointed this out in the Parks and Rec meeting, and I, I, I'll reiterate it again that on the party room that uh, lies between the gymnasium and the pool, I think it's of utmost importance that we put a door on the gymnasium side as well as on the pool side, which we have it planned just because of the nature of if it's a party room, I'm assuming we're going to have a lot of young kids in there, and I just think that it is putting us in an extreme risk situation if we simply allow two or three moms to get together and get to chatting in there, and, and one of them gets distracted and a child wanders off and winds up in that pool. And, and so I'd rather them wind up in the gymnasium bouncing a ball and, and than, than to wind up in that swimming pool accidentally. So yes, sir. At, uh, I think that's... The only thing on the design plan that I really have a major concern with. Okay. We will address that at our first. Uh, we'll have a pre-construction meeting uh, after after award, and uh, that would be one of the design changes we would ask for a price <coughs> on, and then get that moved forward. Okay. Any other questions? All right, you have this recommendation in front of you. We have a motion. Second. A second. Uh, Ms. Wright, we'll call the roll. Ms. Gus Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Washington. Aye. Vice Mayor Young. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We'll hear from the Human Resources Aye. Director with regards to the classification and compensation study. Good one. Good to see you. <clears throat> I should say Mr. Godwin. And good evening, Mayor. We've got the good one and the Godwin coming back to back. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Murfreesboro City Council. I'm delighted this evening to... Uh, do two things. The first is to provide you all with an update from our consultant in the system-wide classification and compensation study, and that is, of course, the management advisory group, uh, otherwise known as MAG. And the second thing this evening is to seek your approval in authorizing MAG to move forward with the next phase of the study, which is the market study. In your packet this evening, you will see that there is a Update from Ms. Long, who is the Executive Vice President and our consultant on the study. Uh, you'll notice in her update uh, some information that has been completed to date. And I'd like to supplement some of that information and let you know how that has been uh, working thus far. Almost a year ago, you authorized an RFCSP, or a, Refe a Request for Competitive Sealed Proposal, to begin seeking the services for this consulting firm. <coughs> So a lot of has transpired and taken place uh, to date. Uh, you'll notice there are several updates with respect to activities that MAG has taken in conjunction with the Human Resources Department, City Administration. Uh, literally every city department head has been interviewed uh, and had the opportunity to prepare information uh, for Ms. Long's review uh, concerning issues that they would like to see addressed. And we've almost... Uh, top 1,300 job analysis questionnaires being completed uh, and uh, a good portion of that number also being reviewed by immediate supervisors. My estimate is almost 500 hours have been spent uh, by city employees and their supervisors reviewing key components of the kind of work that each employee does with the city. Also importantly, uh, MAG sought employee engagement uh, in a, a meeting session uh, at the Wilderness Station that I also participated in. Uh, we had a number of employees there from 13 different departments who uh, had an opportunity to participate uh, in discussing uh, with Ms. Long uh, both the target organizations to conduct the market study in as well as the benchmark positions. And each person there, of course, had an opportunity to also provide input. Uh, and I've received almost 20 uh, pieces of data following that meeting from those employees and others in their departments that have also been in turn shared with MAG. So in essence, a lot of collaborations taken place 
uh, with our city leadership and our city employees, frankly, to get us to this uh, place. You'll see the next steps, of course, uh, this evening. Uh, we intend to ask your approval in finalizing uh, the identification of the survey benchmarks and the target market organizations. I'm going to go into detail in just a couple of minutes about uh, some of those things in terms of the benchmark positions and the organizations. Also, uh, MAG intends to initiate uh, a review of the completed JAQs and the AIF forms from the departments. They will then be developing, of course, a report uh, and draft for input. Uh, they will produce a draft report for the City Council, and then they will, all, of course, uh, be working with our IT department for a transition. To move on and talk then about the organizations for the target organizations for the market survey, it's important that we step back first and look at the process uh, by which uh, we arrived. Um, you'll notice on the second page of the update from Ms. Long, there are three typical groups that are involved in this customized study. And I, I would emphasize that this is a custom study being performed by MAG. The first of those groups are identified as being competitors, and the easy way to think about that group is a group with which we compete for talent. In some cases, we lose employees to these organizations. In other cases, we recruit employees from these organizations on a local basis. So in roughly a 60-mile radius, you'll find, of course, every single one of these organizations listed. The second group of target organizations is considered peers. And uh, you'll notice that this group is a smaller group. It also is uh, predominantly, of course, the public sector group. These are organizations or cities, if you will, uh, that are either similar in size or make up in terms of proximity to a larger metropolitan area, such as Germantown or Collierville. Those are uh, communities of, of approximately 40 and 50,000. Of course, they're right on the outskirts of Memphis. But you'll notice the other larger cities in Tennessee, as we consider those to be peers, as, as, uh, as MAG has identified. Finally, you'll notice a regional listing of uh, cities. These cities, you might also notice uh, from your work and review of the comprehensive plan, uh, are included in the, uh, in the group. Uh, you'll notice uh, there's an addition in the Lexington uh, Fayette Urban County Government Group. Uh, MAG has recently completed a study there and has related uh, information uh, and also benchmarks from that particular study. But each one of these regional uh, areas, I should point out, uh, as well has a socioeconomic uh, and also a, uh, an economic driver such as health care uh, and uh, or manufacturing and retail in its community. This is typically the area that we recruit uh, management individuals or our leadership team from in some of the recent recruitments that we've done, for example, the information technology director. Uh, we conducted a nationwide search uh, for Mr. Lilly's position and had candidates literally from all over the country applying for that particular role. Next, I'd like to talk uh, for a few minutes about the survey benchmarks list. Before I get into the list, you'll notice that there are a large number of positions here. Not every employee's position will be targeted in this benchmark. But as I pointed out a few minutes ago, uh, we have almost 1,200 uh, job analysis questionnaires that have been completed by employees and reviewed by their supervisors. And Ms. Long did a, an excellent job in explaining uh, during our session to employees the purpose of why these benchmark jobs are important. Uh, they have done almost 350 such studies. And typically, when you conduct a study, you try to get, of course, uh, the most reliable uh, information that you can and accurate information that you can. And so if you look down through the list, it may not be apparent, but there's a large number of employees represented. There's almost 273 job classes. In this case, 63 were chosen. Uh, only nine of those are leadership positions. So the biggest percentage of positions chosen of course, our uh, employees who do uh, the work on the line every day. The other thing that I would say uh, in terms of this particular list is all rank and file police and fire employees are part of this study, uh, and that is uh, on purpose. And uh, in, in essence, it would uh, assist us in terms of understanding the other communities to do it that way. 
The other thing that I'll say about this, uh, this particular list um, is that, um, again, not every position is on the list. Some employees will say, well, I, I spoke up and I didn't get included on the list. While that is understood, uh, again, the job analysis questionnaire will be used as a data point uh, in that particular circumstance. The very last thing that I wanted to cover was sort of to bring some context into the market survey with respect to the, uh, the three groups that are going to be surveyed. You'll notice that there is some overlap in the, the three groups that MAG intends to target in the survey. And again, all jobs or all 63 positions, including the leadership team jobs that we had talked about a few minutes ago, uh, will be reviewed for the uh, groups that we consider, again, to be our competitors. Again, th those are cities or organizations that we either recruit from or lose employees to. The same uh, cut of information, if you will, will be taken with the peers, and those are uh, cities of similar size or proximity to larger metropolitan areas. Again, our leadership team jobs will be reviewed in, in those particular cases. And then finally, our regional um, cut at the market survey will primarily focus on those leadership team jobs that we recruit from from long distance. And you might recall in 2011, the city approved, or you approved actually, uh, the Human Resources Department to start using NeoGov, which is a government jobs-based web recruiting tool. And so we literally have candidates from all across the country who apply uh, quite regularly for positions here in Murfreesboro. So this uh, falls into that uh, strategy, if you will, on looking at where we recruit for those particular jobs. That is the update uh, that I have for you this evening, and I will be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, at this time. And I, I want to you know, emphasize the point that uh, Mr. Uh, Godwin made in terms of getting our employees involved. Uh, the process to complete the job analysis questionnaire was a, a significant amount of work, and it was uh, something that was not done when the salary s study was done you know, some 10 years ago. Uh, this was an opportunity to say directly to the consultant the work that they do each and every day. Uh, so we got them involved at a much higher uh, degree than we did last time. Uh, additionally, uh, MAG typically doesn't see uh, the city reaching out and having listened in sessions with their employees on these benchmark positions and, and peer cities, uh, competitor cities and the regional ones, and we did that. Again, that importance of engaging our employees, so I uh, did want to uh, underscore uh, we've heard you uh, talk to us about engaging our uh, employees, and, and we've done that. Any questions? I have one question. Do you, does the NeoGov site is it just for the leadership team positions, or is it for all no. positions? No, it's, it's for every city job opening. Um, we do post uh, some departmental positions only in the department, but by and large, I would say about 95% of all openings are posted in NeoGov on the city webpage. So are we getting a large percentage of uh, inquiries from outside of this range for the non-leadership positions through that or not? Traditionally, we don't, no. Okay. Ms. Gales Harris? Excuse me, a couple of questions. Um, I know you said you looked at uh, 273 classes, and out of that, 63 were chosen. Um, how many classes were not looked at, approximately? What's the difference between those those two numbers? Actually, MAG looked at all 273, and the way that they did that is they took our job table, and then they have a software package, uh, essentially through Microsoft Access. Right and they go and they alphabetize all of the job classes at the same time and include the number of incumbents in the job. Uh, for example, uh, the administrative <coughs> assistant position, Ms. Harris, there are nine job incumbents in that job. The administrative support specialist, there are 25. I'm just taking a couple of examples. Custodian, there are 15. So uh, in essence, their 
their experience drove the decision making. Uh, the Human Resources Department did not select these positions. It was, it was up to MAG. And they based that on the experience of getting survey results back uh, from other target organizations. And I've shared with Mr. Lyons before, we're on the receiving end oftentimes of these same type surveys. And I got one just recently from another city. And they requested data on 127 positions. And I might just to help amplify what um, Mr. Godwin's saying, um, it, on a weekly basis, uh, your city staff receives survey from uh, universities, research organizations, and other communities. Um, we are all very busy, and when you get those surveys, you know there are a lot of other things that you know need to get tackled before we fill out a survey uh, to benefit someone else. So what we really need to do when we're sending out a survey is find that balancing act. Uh, to make it of such a length that they're willing to do it, that we don't overwhelm them with, you know, perhaps all 273, because if we send it out and it's too large, it, we may not get the data back. Um, so we do try to find that balancing act. But again, when we can take these benchmark positions and then look at the job analysis questionnaire provided from the employee, those two pieces of information allow us to, to to slot and you know do some statistical analysis about where the other positions uh, could fit in. Uh, as we've uh, mentioned to you, there is no magic button for us to hit to get this survey information. Someone from another community is going to have to uh, help us out and uh, do us a favor by completing this information uh, and sending it back. So you know, while we understand, you know, some employees may wish, well, why isn't my position included? Uh, practically speaking, the other surveys we see uh, handle this uh, just the same way. So I guess I'm <clears throat> seeing that um, quite a bit of this uh, report and survey is being driven by other cities, and not particularly our city. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the, the question. When we are doing surveys, other cities and asking for their input and everything, so I'm saying a lot of our data that we are uh, collecting now is from other cities. Yes, that, that, is, that is correct. So, so we'll be reaching out to other cities in the, in the manner that we reach out to them, and, and that's where the, the value of the consulting experience comes in. Uh, they know the typical positions that are easy to benchmark or easier to benchmark that represent a large number of employees. There's almost 750 employees that are involved in these 63 positions. Yes. So that's almost 60% of our employees. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was going to actually ask. So the, out of those 63 positions, it's, you know, the percentage of employees that we're covering is much higher than the 63 out of 273 or whatever, right? It really is. It's, again, yeah. it's almost 700 and 740 employees total that are covered by these positions. So, so they're the ones that have the, in most cases, most of the employees in them. How many employees do we have total? About 920 full-time, uh, depending on the season, uh, three, 400 part-time. So I got you. We had, we had 1,297 JAQ seats that were filled during the job analysis. So 60% or more of all of them full-time, part-time. That, that is correct. But on a full-time basis, it's, it's going to be a greater 80, percentage than it's that. 80, 80 percent. 80 percent, yeah. For example, part-time uh, position with the biggest job holder is lifeguard. Uh, there are 48 lifeguards uh, working for the city, and that was one of the jobs <clears throat> that was chosen. So again, you, you're, you're seeing, as I did, from their choices and selections, a large number of employees being chosen by these benchmark positions. And I know we also talked about when the consultants were here, when they were doing their um, presentation, we talked about the police and fire department being high-risk jobs pulling them out of this particular survey because of the nature of what they do as far as pay, and I see that they are included. So I'm a little confused on that. I know we said we we're going to look at because their jobs are so high risk, maybe doing a survey with them and without them, but I just see them that they're in here. Yeah, every single rank and file fire and police uh, employee is, is represented, and you, uh, of course, this may go back to the uh, focus and framework document that you approved um, in October of last year. But, but in essence, the idea was to understand the market for each step in the public safety positions. And in order to do that, 
uh, literally every position has to be uh, market tested, if you will. So it's very difficult to follow that pay philosophy without looking at how all of the, uh, the firefighters and the drivers uh, and the, of course, the patrol officers and the sergeants stack up. It's just really difficult to pick and choose. So MAG's philosophy is to essentially market test them all. And, and Ms. Harris, I think to, to maybe help answer your question, you know, when we look at trying to match uh, certain positions, there may be responsibilities of, you know, some of the other jobs that become a little bit more difficult to get an exact match. Uh, but a police officer in all these communities is going to have, you know, those same roles, responsibilities, as you, you mentioned, the, uh, the, the safety element. So those become a very good match for a police officer in, in Murfreesboro to Collierville, to Franklin, to Brentwood, uh, to Knoxville. Those tend to match up better than some other positions. So we think the data that will come back uh, should help us uh, determine where the, the pay should be. And on our regional um from a regional standpoint, the cities that I see listed, how many of them have the same amenities, uh, <clears throat> amenities that Murfreesboro has? I mean, when we're making a comparison, are we comparing apples to apples? Some of these cities, um, yeah, do me, they really look like Murfreesboro with our university, yeah. chamber, uh, hospital? I mean, do they really, is that really a snapshot of what we look like, or are we just comparing? Yeah, let me try to handle that one as well. Uh, during the comprehensive plan, uh, we had considerable conversations with Ken DeKeest uh, from an overall direction of the city, uh, quality of life, uh, the services provided. We were trying to find other communities that perhaps we could learn from, be inspired by, and had much in common with us. Uh, and after a lot of analysis, these were the communities that were selected for the comprehensive plan. Um, we felt that since they were a, uh, a good match overall in the city, uh, that this likewise uh, would uh, be a good match for Murfreesboro. In many cases, these are rapidly growing communities. Um, they have universities in them. Uh, several of these have our college uh, universities are rapid growth, uh, are very progressive. Uh, so we do think that they have uh, a great deal in common. Certainly, no, there's no place like Murfreesboro. Uh, so finding an exact match is, is somewhat of a challenge, but you know, many of these other communities enjoy a, a very high quality of life. Um, Money Magazine, I think, came out with the uh, rankings of you know, the best places to live, and uh, several of these were, were in there, and Murfreesboro was on the list as well. Yeah, I know we ranked number 10 in that um, survey. Mm -hmm. Now, when the uh, study is complete and MAG gives us the results, will they be given to the council? Yes, they will. Directly? I mean, yes. as soon as? Yes, they will. Yeah, that, that's their intent is to, is to present to the city council. Yes, ma'am. At the same time, HR, at the same time you get it, or we get it at the same time, or will you get it before we get it? But there'll be a there'll be a draft because there has to be some recognition of some of the uh, parameters of, of our jargon and such as that. But yes, and we'll, we'll expect Miss Long to come here and, and present uh, the the study to uh, the council uh, as well. So you know, we want to you know, we've been very transparent about this and intend to continue to be so. Right, but that's what I'm saying. The council will get it at the same time HR gets it. Typically, on studies like this, Ms. Harris, staff's going to look at it to see if there are errors or, or problems. We're certainly not going to change the consultant's recommendation, but there may be some things that we need to ask them to go back and take a look at. Uh, I can assure you, you know, that we, we are not trying to hide anything, but we do uh, do some quality uh, control over it uh, before it, it comes to council. But those documents are all you know, certainly uh, available. Oh, I'm not. Indicating that you know you're trying to hide anything. I know all of this is transparent, but as a council member, because we did decide on this group and we did hire, hire this group, I would like to see the original draft, the same thing you all see when you go through and do your tweaking. I'd like to see it before it's tweaked. Since we voted on this. Um, Group, I would like for the rough draft to come to council before it's tweet. Um, but there's a, hopefully there's an understanding. You know, again, we do want to be transparent, but sometimes consultants uh, have errors. We see problems. We'll send it back to them. But you know, the consultant's report is the consultant's report. I think the thing we would want to make sure, and, and I, I'm, 
understand exactly and don't disagree yet, but I, I think we'd want to make sure that there wouldn't be any, say, for instance, that a job description had a $60,000 uh, pay range and it came back as $600,000 because someone <coughs> accidentally added, added a number. So uh, that, that would be the thing I would be more concerned with, that we distribute something that may not be accurate, um, but I'm fine however we want to want to do that, Ms. Scales. Harris, I, I understand what you're saying. Is that what your your thought would be, Mr. Lyons? That it, when you say scrub, it's not like you're changing the results. No, the, sir. You're, you're just we, saying we, we, the the consultant's recommendations will be the consultant's recommendations. You know, they're the experts in this field. Um, Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Well, if necessary, we could Let's go serious. potentially send out a, under a confidential. Well, we're, we'll, we'll keep. We're going to keep the draft. Yeah. Those don't go in in the shredder, uh, and we'll certainly can. <coughs> when we communicate back to them, we'll we'll do that in writing, so you know that there's a, a record. But you know, we're we're not. Uh, we we want to do this the right way. We understand there's. Uh, this is going to be important to to the employees. Uh, it's important to the council. Important to the community. So. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Cowan. I do think it's appropriate to uh, have a motion uh, yes. to approve uh, this next phase of the study this evening. I make a motion to approve. Second. Ms. McGann, you're shaking your head. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <laughs> Ms. Wright, we call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. LaLance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. We'll hear from the city manager with regards to the Murfreesboro 2035 plan update. Yes, uh, Mayor, uh, members of council. I uh, did want to give you uh, just a quick uh, progress report on the city's comprehensive plan. Obviously, in late August, uh, we had a uh, very successful kickoff uh, to the comprehensive plan that included uh, task force uh, meeting, a community uh, meeting that was attended by 200 individuals, which we were very excited about the turnout. Uh, the next night, uh, we had the joint workshop with uh, City Council and, and the Planning Commission. Uh, since that time, Kendrick Keast has continued to you know, get additional data and, and statistics uh, about growth and about the community. Uh, so they continue to work on uh, those sorts of uh, items. Uh, as you also know, uh, the Mind Mixer website was set up where Murfreesboro residents could uh, get online and uh, comment, and so I, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to really do a little bit of a commercial for uh, Murfreesboro2035.com. This is our online discussion forum. Um, Ken and Keist and the city have worked to put uh, questions uh, online. Uh, to date, we've had 200 people sign up on the uh, Murfreesboro2035.com and received over 125 comments. Uh, Kendig Keist tells us this is a, uh, a lot higher participation rate than they see in uh, many other communities, so we're very excited about that. So I thought I'd use the council meeting as an opportunity to try to get more folks to plug in. So uh, this week we posted several questions. Uh, what unique phrase best describes Murfreesboro and could you help brand the city? Uh, for instance, uh, the city of Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love, and we were trying to solicit some uh, thought and ideas about that. Uh, we asked uh, questions about uh, what kind of transportation projects would improve Murfreesboro, what, where are particular roadways where there are problems, sidewalks, uh, bike lanes. Uh, so this becomes a, a very easy way for uh, people to participate. What's uh, interesting about uh, the, the website, it's is it gives people an opportunity when they um, put a comment online, uh, Murfreesboro residents can like that idea um, and they can uh, comment on it as well. So we think this is a great way to have a community conversation about things that are important uh, in Murfreesboro. Uh, so again, Murfreesboro2035.com to sign up for that. Uh, what will happen next, uh, while Kendi Keist is uh, developing the, the drafts of Chapter uh, 1 and 2, which will be uh, about infrastructure and growth capacity, uh, is uh, we will be setting the next community meeting, which will be held in uh, early December. Uh, the date of that has not been set. We're getting very close to, to picking the date for that. 
Um, and uh, just wanted to give you all a quick update that work uh, continues on the comprehensive plan. Uh, much of it is kind of back uh, behind the scenes right now, but uh, that is all in preparation for that December uh, meeting where the community can come and, and uh, sit down again with uh, the consultants. So i uh, be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Elias. Yes. Rob. Um, what, could we, what should we tell the people who are on the task force to expect from here? Is there nothing for them to do until December? That's correct. And what will happen um, you know, really from this point forward is when um, the consultant comes here in December, they're going to have Chapter 1 and 2 in front of the task force for them to review, comment on, and, and give direction. While they're here, they'll start working on the next chapter, which I believe is transportation. Uh, so each meeting then becomes that stair-stepped. They deliver a chapter and do the homework for the next chapter. Uh, so at this point, there's not much for the, the task force to do, and, and it'll get a little easier and more tangible from this point forward. I know during the, the kickoff meeting, you know, comprehensive plan, what's it going to look like, what's involved, it, a lot of it was kind of a, a, a conversation. <coughs> Uh, but from this point forward, there will be something tangible, hard for them to look at and react and respond to, um, and uh, that will be the next step for the task force. Well, ho hopefully there's, they're watching tonight, but it might not be a bad idea to send out an email. I mean, that's been mm -hmm. six weeks ago or whatever well, it's been. And I'd be glad to do that. In fact, one of the things that um, we want to do is improve the city's website about the comprehensive plan because we intend to take these documents and make them available to the public online so that they could see those as well. Uh, so it's not just the task force being able to see this information, but we do want to share that with everybody. It might not be a bad idea to get them engaged in trying to go ahead and get more people onto the website and okay. signed up to during this middle yeah. period. You know, and IT had to kind of take some things apart and put it back together, but I think their hope is by mid-October that uh, website will be up and running. Uh, I think Brentwood's uh, comprehensive plan website looked uh, pretty attractive and was very informative, and so we're looking at that to see what we can do to replicate uh, the Brentwood website. So, like I said, no action needed from the council tonight, but did uh, want to keep this in front of everybody and keep you up to date. Any questions? Uh, no, I have a little comment, I guess. Sure. I just hope uh, out of this plan that uh, it, it, it ends up getting a, getting a lot of diversity of input. You have certain sec sectors of the community that don't get involved in hardly anything. And I want them to know as a councilman and the rest of the council members that we want you to be engaged. This is your opportunity. If you're listening, this is your opportunity to speak your mind, have you know, whatever you want to say, and, and input back to Rick and myself, who we are on them, and Susan, you are too, on, on the uh, on the task force, uh, because what happens in this city affects all of you. It even affects folks in the county uh, sometimes. So my goal, as best as I can do it, is to try to get as many folk involved and engaged and and participate. Uh, it's so easy to do going online. Uh, so uh, that's that's my prayer, and my hope. Uh, Doing this plan because it's going to be this is a one-time deal, uh, and uh, we need the input from all ethnicities, uh, whomever. Say your piece, and uh, so we can make sure we get as much participation and engagement as we can. That's all I got to say. <clears throat> Good comments. Okay, if there are no other. Uh, <clears throat> Comments or questions? We'll move to item number nine. Consider recommendations of the assistant city attorney with regards to an agreement with Exo Communications LLC to allow installation of fiber optic cable in the city right away. You have a yes. Agreement. Good evening, member and uh, council members. Uh, I did hand out just before the meeting a revised contract. Uh, the one that uh, was attached. This is not materially different from the one that was attached to the agenda packet but uh, we've been negotiating details for the last several days and there are there are some detailed changes the substance of it is the same uh, as I think many of you know EXO communications is one of the companies that installs fiber optic cable uh, in uh, in rights away uh, and sometimes on on electric poles in various communities uh, the city is required under law to allow them access to our rights of way uh, if there's room uh, for them to be there. Uh, we do have the right, however, to put reasonable regulations uh, on their usage of the right of way. 
and we can charge reasonable fees for them to be there. And as my cover memo said, we're in the process of establishing an ordinance where uh, we'll be adopting a fee structure. Uh, we're, we're in the writing it. We're not yet ready to be establishing it, but we're writing it, uh, working on an ordinance to establish a fee structure and other regulatory measures for for that. Uh, EXO has provided, uh, has installed uh, some fiber here, uh, mostly close to the square, uh, several years ago, and they're now have now come to us with a proposal to connect to where their fiber exists today, and that's at the intersection of North Spring Street and East College. Uh, it's the, I believe it was the mortgage office facility for uh, Mid-South Bank, and they have their uh, a large fiber connection at that, uh, at that intersection. They want to connect from that intersection, run along the right-of-way of, uh, the north right-of-way of East College Street, and then over to Highland, and then run on up to the Bell Street building uh, that MTSU required, acquired a bit while ago from the hospital. Uh, MTSU is anxious for this project to get going. Uh, they need additional internet capacity and additional security for, uh, for their internets, and this will uh, help to get that. None of them want to wait for us to write an ordinance. So in, in order to accommodate the project and, and, and to keep this going, we've uh, negotiated a contract with EXO, uh, and the copy that uh, has, was provided to you tonight, I believe, is what it's going to be signed. There's certainly a possibility that there will a, be a word change or two, but that's going to be the, certainly the, the substance of the agreement. Uh, this contract protects the city. Uh, by requiring substantial <coughs> liability insurance to be in place, uh, it requires a bond to cover the repair of any sidewalks that are, happen to be uh, either damaged or necessarily cut in order to do this project, uh, driveways that may have to be uh, worked around or worked uh, through. Uh, it also, we have negotiated a, a three and a half year cash deposit. I believe that the, the uh, the version that was went out with the uh, agenda uh, referred to a letter of credit. Uh, in lieu of the letter of credit, we're going to have a cash deposit that will last for three and a half years to help cover uh, the, it, if some of the trees that are in this area where they'll be uh, installing the cable uh, are, look, are dying, uh, dead or dying by the, in three and a half years, and it looks like it's related to the cable, we'll have some protection to replace those trees. The, we, it provides us the right to collect usage fees on this cable once that an assumption it is established. Once it is established, we'll be able to then collect fees on this cable, as well as the other cable that uh, is existing in, in uh, Murfreesboro that XO had installed. Uh, in the event we do some road work in that area that requires this cable to be moved, uh, it'll be moved at XO's expense. Uh, they will register this with Tennessee One Call. Uh, they will also provide us as-built drawings when the project is complete. Uh, nonetheless, uh, things happen, and if in the future uh, that cable is damaged accidentally by the city when it's doing some work on a water line, a sewer line, or something else, we've agreed that our liability for actual cost of repairing that will be capped at $7,500. Uh, I believe this is a, a good agreement that will let us go forward, uh, let them get started quickly and uh, hopefully finish quickly and, and get the university's internet system running better than it's running today. Uh, and we recommend your approval authorizing the city manager to sign it. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Lance, who, who's taking a look at the number of driveways, trees, yards? Well, who, who's looked at that kind of impact as far as what's going to happen and how many people are going to be affected? I mean, is that somebody done that, or am I? Yes, that even uh, a legitimate question? both the city engineering department, Mr. Griffiths and his crew, uh, water and sewer have been involved in, in looking at this. The transportation department, uh, Mr. Richardson uh, and uh, uh, Ron Balachandran have have looked at all this. Uh, water and sewer will have an inspector uh, on site. During now, most of this is going to be done by a directional bore. They don't plan to trench. Uh, there may be some place where they have to trench. They will also 
They will dig uh, a pilot hole to locate the water service lines and the sewer service lines that are that are crossing the, the right of way where they'll be putting so that they can actually establish the the depths of those and then be able to bore under them. Uh, but it's a construction project and things can happen, which is why they're going to be uh, they'll have good insurance and have some bonds posted. So uh, about a, do, you, do we know how, about how many property owners, I guess would be the right word, are going to be affected by this down through that stretch? We do, but I don't have that number. Uh, I don't have that with me. And I, I don't have the drawing that you could, I believe attached to the agenda materials is a, uh, uh, it's a, a drawing that shows the route, proposed route that will go from North Spring over to Highland and then from Highland on up to uh, the Bell Street building. If I recall, it's three blocks on college. It might be four. And there are six yeah. houses on each block, maybe, five. That's yes. right. So it's certainly not hundreds, but there are several. And every one of those houses will have a water line coming from the street to the house and a sewer lateral coming from the street to the house. Some of them have gas lines. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult job. It's a complicated job. I know that XO and their contractor have done this kind of work before, and we'll be working with them, supporting them as much as we can to make sure it's done right, and we know that they're going to do their best to do it right and, and get the cable laid so that they can uh, provide the services to the college. Are we going to have a process in place to let them know what's going on, the, neighbor, the residents, the people who live there? Um, or are we just going to start being in their yard? We will establish, yes, we will make that, we'll have that communication. Yeah, that's a good thing to do, uh, is to put in, in the process of plan to pre-notify those neighbors uh, ahead of the construction getting to them. Maybe a couple of weeks ahead of time, so they can prepare what they need. Think they need to prepare to uh, for the construction to to come, so they won't just catch them off guard. Two thirty-three, Mr. Rice, can we, as part of our contract that we're signing, can we stipulate that notification even to the point that we say on these residents that there may be door knocker or door hangers or something that we would let yeah. notify the residents? I think that's a great suggestion. The, the door hangers for water and sewer projects has been very successful in letting folks know who was coming and what was going to happen. So, yeah, I think we can handle that on without making it necessarily part of this contract, but just make it part of the the, the construction meetings and the requirements that and uh, that. And I don't believe there'd be any problem with that. I, I just I think that should be the re responsibility of the contractor and not our staff to go do the notification process. Yeah. Um, so that way they're they're yeah. doing that. Excellent suggestion. Thank okay. you. So do I. Uh, a there is a representative of EXO here tonight. Uh, you think that's something you can take care of? Oh, uh, that's standard operating procedure. Great. Okay. We're going to have any disturbance or blood on any sidewalks. You know, it'll be written. Great. Okay, in case the, for those who might not have heard it on the, uh, uh, the representative from XO Communications said that uh, such advance notice is standard operating procedure. Uh, they will uh, give some kind of written notice and generally they'll, be, they'll knock on doors to try to let people know what's going to be going on. Even okay, the work would not be in these people's actual yards. It's going to be the, the line is intended to be laid in that grass strip between the back of the curb and the sidewalk. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so... But it, it's tight quarters. Yeah, there's uh, that I'm grass strip's not very wide. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> okay. Mr. Smotherman. Mr. Ives, you mentioned the establishment of a fee. Have we never had a fee before for this fiber uh, access to the right of way? No, we've not. Uh, not as such. We have uh, uh, we have a, a franchise agreement with Comcast where they provide, uh, have a, a city franchise to provide cable TV service to the city. Uh, Atmos Gas has a franchise where they uh, provide gas to our residents. Uh, AT&T has a statewide franchise which allows them to come into our rights of way and put in uh, 
their facilities for, for cable television and telephone and other things. I don't know what the percentage is on uh, Atmos, but on uh, Comcast and AT&T, they pay us a percentage of, I think, essentially their gross revenues for the right to be in wherever they want, basically, in our right-of-way, subject to reasonable regulations of how, you know, whether there's space and that sort of thing. Uh, with the advent of uh, fiber, uh, fiber optic cables for, that is internet and not necessarily just telephone and not just cable television, but mostly internet, uh, this company, none of, the, none of the fiber providers other than AT&T and Comcast have a uh, franchise agreement that allows them to be in our right of way for a fee. So we need to come up with a plan for that. The courts have told us we cannot charge the same kind of a flat percentage of, a, of gross revenues that we have charged for the cable television. Uh, but we need to, uh, uh, we, can, we can have a, a charge a fee for the use of our right of way. And that's what we're, part of what we're working on, looking at, and trying to uh, establish what that would be. I've also heard that the university is extremely excited about having the access to the fiber because of the slow connections that they're having on the Internet service that they uh, have. So. They are, I believe, quite anxious to have this project uh, <clears throat> underway and completed. And I, I, I hate to use the term because they'd always use it when I was around computers a lot, and they'd always say it was going to be transparent to the user, which meant we wouldn't see any change, but we generally did. But with this boring operation, generally it is pretty transparent, um, except you'll see a little paint on the ground and some lines drawn and stuff. Uh, they have already marked, you know, they've, they've marked that probably some time ago, several weeks at least, and they will be, I mean, they probably have to recheck that at this point. But, yeah, there's paint on the ground now, uh, and hopefully uh, it will be transparent. Thank you. Good questions. Mr. Ives, what's the timeline? When are they wanting to start? Uh, they would probably start tomorrow if we had the permit ready. Uh, but it'll, it'll be soon. I don't know exactly a okay. date. I don't know if they have one, but it'll, it'll be very soon. Uh, estimate the time for the project? I would say that if we have an opportunity to go today, it's going to be it is already Thursday. I would anticipate there's a reasonable chance that this will get started next week. Okay. Whenever it starts, what's the uh, timeline from start to completion? Yeah. Estimate. An estimate for that, David? Okay, about two to three weeks. Oh, Two to three weeks of activity. Get it going. You need a motion? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, please. I don't want to hold them up. I move for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Wright, say it quick. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. LaLance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Ralphs. Uh, we'll consider recommendations of the City Re Recorder Finance Director with regards to change order number one, Tax Finance Office Remodel. I'd like to start with a public service announcement in that the uh, tax bills for the City of Murfreesboro were mailed yesterday. So we, if you're a we, property we, owner, you've probably heard today. from me recently. <laughs> mm. um, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, those bills are due and payable by December 31st, and uh, if you didn't get yours in the mail, please call our office by the middle of October. By then, they should all be out, and I will be glad to get your replacement bill. Additionally, those uh, notices can be printed off from our website, so we try to be accessible even after office hours. That leads me into our change order. During the summer, my tax <coughs> department staff and my accounts payable staff have been out of pocket while we've been remodeling our office. The first phase of that is approaching completion, and uh, during that construction period, we found some items that needed to be 
uh, tweaked a little in the design, both for Phase 1 and some upcoming items we already know about in Phase 2. So we have a small construction uh, change order here. Those items total about $3,600. Additionally, uh, Gary Whitaker has requested that we use our on-site contractor to tweak some heating problems that have uh, come about from the energy efficiency project that we recently did. And that's an additional increase of 68575 for a total of $72,177.70. Uh, it is recommended that this change order be approved. And uh, we had a letter of recommendation with an itemization attached from Griggs and Maloney. Questions? No questions. I'll move for passage. Second. I have a motion. Second. Ms. Wright, you'll call the roll. Ms. Kels Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Washington. Aye. Vice Mayor Young. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. That's right. Uh, beer permits. We have several tonight. We have a special event permit application from uh, the Discovery Center for uh, a couple events, one on February 27th of next year and one on May 1st of next year. And um, that application is in order for approval. Additionally, we have an application for an ownership change at a restaurant at 1714 Fort Parkway. Everything is ready for that permit to be issued with your approval. We have another ownership change for a market at 408 West Northfield Boulevard. Additionally, uh, on this one, everything has been done for codes and the background check meets our requirements for approval. We have a restaurant located at 2395 New Salem Highway, Suite J. That is a new location and the uh, Codes inspections are not quite complete there. The beer, uh, the background application portion is complete, and we would like to issue this permit once codes uh, inspections are completed and approved. We have another location at 223 West Main Street, which is an ownership change and name change. This location is also lacking building and codes inspection completion, but the background inspections. Uh, have met our requirements. And we have a hotel at 325 North Thompson Lane, which is an ownership change. We are fine with the background check at this point, but we are also lacking the building and codes inspections approval for this one. And finally, we have a uh, restaurant at 352 West Northfield Boulevard, Suite F, which is an ownership change and name change. This location lacks the building and codes inspections, but the background inspections have met our requirements. So we would uh, ask that those that are ready we be allowed to issue, and the rest of those that uh, finished their building codes inspections we could issue at that time. I have a question. Ms. Ms. Wright, the one at 223 West Main Street, is that a name change from what to what? Do you have that information? I don't have that listed, but I believe that is where Brewster's might have been. Okay. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have these beer permits in front of you? <clears throat> I'll move for passage with the constraints you listed. Okay. Got a motion? Second. Second. Ms. Wright, we'll call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. LaLance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Uh, you have a list of the state or the statement in front of you, a list of the bills to be paid? Move, we pay the bills. Second. Uh, Mr. Smotherman, Ms. Harris, Ms. Wright, go call the roll. Excuse me, Mayor. Yes. Was the workers' comp matter didn't seem to be on the payment list. I want to make sure that that's included in approval. 
Well, I, I asked the risk manager about getting a bill for that, and he said he was not expecting a check for that at this time. But I'm happy to include it as something for statements. I don't have anything to list. I think we just need the council's approval so that we can go forward. Once you're ready to add that. And that is something that he gave me as other business, so that hasn't been presented to them yet. thought it was distributed. Yes, but okay. he, he explained to me it would be listed as other business and that you would present it. Okay. <laughs> would you like to include the, the information that's been handed to us that we have uh, yes. included as a, additional statements to be yes, paid? Yes, an authorization to pay. We okay. won't be paying statements. tomorrow, but authorization. Mr. Schmutherman, would you? I'll mind? accept that to my motion. Okay. I accept that to my second. Okay. Ms. Wright, if you'll call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. LaLance? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Washington? Aye. Vice Mayor Young? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any board and commission appointments <coughs> and, and um, other business. Mr. 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 Durkin, Durkin. Item. Mayor, members of the City Council, tonight I bring for you for your consideration and approval the work authorization with Atkins to provide engineering services for the uh, runway extension and overlay project. As you know, we've been working with Atkins and the Tennessee Aeronautics Division uh, on this point to make some improvements uh, to the runway. Uh, Atkins has provided us a work authorization with a scope and also uh, fees associated with that work. As part of that process, we take the uh, fees and that scope and have another firm uh, review that that has been completed by Allen and Hushall and reviewed by the Tennessee Aeronautics Division and it was found to be in line and uh, in, in the guidelines with the FAA and similar to projects in this area. So the uh, overall cost for this uh, work that Atkins will be performing is $405,869.84. This will be covered under a grant uh, that will, will assist us with 95% of the cost of this project. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them at this time. <clears throat> Hearing no questions, I'd move for acceptance and approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Wright, the call roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Washington. Aye. Vice Mayor Young. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Any more business to come before the council? Okay. Seeing none. Oh, Mr. Schmother. I just want to pay a compliment to somebody. Melissa Wright, I was in uh, the uh, newly remodeled offices upstairs, and some of them are newly created offices. And I walked in one, and I noticed how nice the furniture was. And I was informed that that entire office had been furnished for $150. That was for a cabinet, a case, a desk, everything that was in that office. <laughs> and it was surplus stuff that Melissa had picked up down in Nashville. So just the prudent uh, expenditure of taxpayers' dollars, I think you did a fantastic job, and uh, I want to say thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the help from the state and from some other city employees. Great. All right. See you no other business. We'll stay in adjourned.